Good morning. Um, today we're going to do, and this may be the first time I've called it anything uh, we for the winning entanglements, but uh, it seemed like a good title for what we're doing here. Uh, and I want to focus on the data which we've been accumulating. One of the very important parts of we is um, that's completely online. All the data that is supplied goes into a server and can be saved um, and is saved and can be reviewed and analyzed by group and by viewer. Um, and so we're going to look at some of that and look at it um, in a way which I believe can be really potentially important for the viewers and also for the group managers um, in the context of improving the hit rate. Um, there's a lot of other things going on in winning entanglements, like just deepening yourself and your connection with your precognitive self, uh, etc. But today we want to focus. Today we want to focus on the um, the on the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I keep getting these calls. I need to figure out how to turn that off. We want to focus on the data and uh, the hit rate. Now, one important concept is um, when you make your prediction, and, and this gets then passed on to the group manager, how does the group manager, and in fact, if you were doing this yourself, how do you get a sense of how certain you are that that prediction is going to be a hit? Well, we refer to that as the probability. That makes sense. You know, uh, um, how much better than chance are you? If it's, we are primarily working with 50-50 chance um, outcomes. Well, do you have a 60% chance, a 70% chance? Boy, do you feel you have a 100% chance? Um, and that really is the key thing that we have to do and have to figure out really in terms of um, applying our predictions. So, one of the things which of course is is the um, simplest way of saying, okay, if my hit rate in the past has been, say, 60%, 65%. Now, we use fractions. I think you all understand 0 0.60 multiplied by 100, that's 60%. So if your personal hit rate up to now with we has been 60 65%, say, well, it would be reasonable to think, okay, on my next prediction, I believe it's going to be in that range, 60, 65%. Well, it turns out there's so much variation in people's hit rates um, that that just doesn't seem to work as well as, as we'd like. Um, and we feel um, that we need other measures. So this is what you know I've been looking at really for quite a while. And um, one of the key measures we're looking at, and I'm going to discuss some others, is something which is called LZ. Now, I don't want to get too much into the mathematics of it, but I will just a little in a moment. But what's important is to understand that if precognition was not a reality, there would be no measure that you could find that would cause any measure of a personal hit rate or a group hit rate. We have most data for the group, so that's what we're going to be looking at first. But there would be no measure whatsoever that would get you much off the 50-50 line. You know, chance, sometimes, yes, you do a prediction and you're going to get some hits and you're going to get some misses, and um, but you'd be right around the 50% line. This particular measure, 
which is kind of related to a normal distribution curve measure. Um, you know, you've probably heard those kind of words before, but don't have to worry about the mathematics. Um, what we do is, and I'm going to give you a sense of this measure, so for each group prediction, so each one of these points are for one of the specific we groups. Now, for that group, we get multiple predictions because we typically have, say, three to five viewers predicting for that group. Each one of them, as you know, give their confidence rankings. So we take the difference between the confidence rankings. Now, the four confidence CRs that you provide, we can come up with four differences. Okay. So for each individual viewer, we have four, we call them, say, DCR for differences in the CRs. So there are four of those. And then let's say we have three um, viewers, then I would have 12 of these DCRs. Now, the average of those 12s, which could be called the mean, okay, would be um, kind of an interesting number. If things were random, you'd expect that mean to be somewhere near zero. Now, it turns out there's this thing called standard deviation, and what the standard deviation is, is like you take the square of all of these DCRs, um, you square them all, you divide by how many of them you have, and you take the square root. So what it is, is a measure of how big these differences are. And you take the mean and divide it by roughly the average absolute magnitude size, um, and you get this LZ. Now, the significance of the LZ in a normal distribution curve, and I even thought about talking about that a little bit, but I don't want to do that, is that it tells you how far away you are from what you would expect, the mean. In our case, if there was no precognition, we would expect the mean to be zero, and we wouldn't expect the standard deviation, this LZ number, to get much bigger than one or so. If it gets up to two in the normal distribution sense, you are at the point where that is what's called the 5%, the 0.05 level. Um, in the medical community, when LZ gets up to a two, you start saying you have very significant results. Okay, so bottom line, LZ is kind of a measure of how significant you are in terms of the differences in your confidence rankings. This curve, so each one of these points are now measures of LZs. Um, if I take all of those LZs, and I order them from the highest, which I expect, because I believe in precognition. So I went in not with the, what's called the null hypothesis, um, but this disproves the null hypothesis. What we did is order these based on the largest LZs. Okay, so here we're seeing a graph up to three. Um, and then... Um, we then take, remember, associated with each one of these now is a group hit or miss, so a zero or a one. We then can come up with the hit rate for all of these LZs, which are greater than a particular one. So if we start really way down here at the bottom, what you can see is this point here has a hit rate of 0.56. That means that virtually all of our group predictions at this point 
has a hit rate of like 0.56, 56%. That's for everything in here. But if we look at the LZs, which were two or greater, we have a range in here, which is as low as, you know, maybe 58%, some points there, but up to 65%. If we were willing to wait until an LZ of greater than 2.5, our hit rate now goes up to somewhere between 65% and 70%. This fact that there's a trend here shows that precognition is acting, um, and we now have some predictability in it. It turns out there are 10 points that are up here um, that are all, this is like the 11th point that show um, they're above 64% uh, or so uh, on average. Now, this um, is at the group level. So I think you have a sense of that, and what the importance of it is, is that we have another measure, and if we were willing to wait, and it's hard to do, because you can see how many of these are below that, you actually can get a, a rather high, highish hit rate. Now, now remember, this is for the group, this is all the viewers, so these are the new viewers, the old viewers. Let's start looking at the idea of what individual viewers are doing now. Now, typically, we've been looking at plots like this for individual viewers and for groups, um, and it's a reasonably good place to start. This is a viewer where I'm showing they have 11 sessions not counting passes. I've taken out virtually all of the passes and are just showing uh, what we call the wagerable predictions, which are those predictions which have the confidence rankings, the CRs of greater than or equal to 3.5. So if none of the confidence rankings were greater than 3.5, that person, hey, on that particular day, they felt they wanted to pass, and, and that's fine. Um, but these are those where there were some CRs uh, greater than 3.5. So this is the cumulative. So what that means is on their first session, um, they got a miss because the cumulative hit rate was a zero. Here they had two. The second one was a miss, so a miss and a miss gives you a cumulative hit rate of zero. On their third one, they got a hit. It went up, notice it went up to 33%, 0.33, because they got one hit and two misses. Um, then they got another miss, okay? So now they're at 25%, one hit with um, um, three misses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they got up here to almost, um, you know, over 60%, ended off at what, 30, 40, 55%. So their overall prediction here is 55%. So if we just looked at this, we'd say this person has a 55% probability of their next prediction being a hit. However, this concept of LZ that we just went through can also be used for individual viewers. So, you know, I haven't prettied all of this up. All of this that you're seeing is works in progress, um, and uh, but you can you can understand what we have down here are the LZs, and, and this is virtually all of them for all of their eleven uh, predictions. Um, and so each prediction, based on the four CRs that they have. Uh, give an LZ. And if you look here, and again, this is the probability of 
any given LZ the hit rate above that. So to help you understand this a little bit, let's start with the highest LZ. Their highest LZ here was maybe 2.7. It was a hit. So the very highest one and all the ones above it and there's only one, that was 100%. The second one was a hit as well. The way I know that is it's at 100%. So these two together are the accumulative of L hit rate greater or equal to this LZ of 2.6. So 2.6 and 2.7 had a hit rate of 100%. The next one, which is down here, that they happened to get was a 0.8, say, an LZ of 0.8, and it was a miss. And if you look at that, you say, ah, this one was a miss. Remember, each one of these has their associated hit or miss. This one was a miss. These two are hits. So the average, um, uh, was, well, now this is at 70, oh no, 80, wait, wait. Why am I getting confused here? Oh, I think, oh, that's why, because there's one, yeah, there's one, you see one down here, the P is covering it, that's two out of three, which is 66% right here, the next one, which is a hit, which is the 75%, so this point here represents three out of four, which are these, and then the rest of these are done in the same way, and this is this 50 six or whatever percent it is here, which is all of them. Now notice, key point here is with this measure, we now see a pretty good trend. You know, it's still early. Um, a year from now, when this person has a lot more, we'd sure like to see it look like this, because now all of us would be able to say with a reasonably high probability, if this curve fills in like this, that if the next one, she got a 2, her probability would be 90%. Wouldn't that be terrific? But we don't know that yet. And all the viewers do not look this clean. So we're very early in this. This is, you know, you're, you're seeing what I'd like to think of as a scientist is brand new cutting edge um, um, uh, science here in terms of looking at precognition. But we saw this in the group and I am seeing this in a number of the viewers where this trend is showing up in this way. It's actually quite encouraging. Now, there are other measures that I'm looking at. Um, the idea is to get more and more data and to see what kind of trend we can find. This happens to be using the same idea as here, but with only four numbers. What I'm seeing with, by four numbers, I mean four of the differences in the confidence rankings, those DCRs. When you only have four of them, sometimes this LZ got to be very, very large. I was having cases much larger than 10. In fact, in some cases, because there was a standard deviation division, it would go to infinity. So it made sense to use what has turned out to be the average of looking at everybody's standard deviation um, using a value of 2. So I just said, okay, let's use a standard deviation of 2, and in that LZ formula, um, we'll just take the sum of the differences, um, the mean then, take the mean of them and divide by 2. So, um, you know, if there, you, you expect the mean to be near 0, um, but using that definition, we ended off, very interestingly enough, with a different curve because it reorders them, uh, and the top four 
she actually got hits on them all. And then she got a miss on the fifth one. So um, um, that puts her at 80%, um, four out of five hits. Uh, so this is that curve. It was just another way of looking at that exact same data. Uh, now, this basically just talks about um, what what the mean was now. So her means turned out to be two. We don't have to worry about that. Here now um, is another way of looking at it, which is a curve on her confidence ranking differences. The confidence rankings you know about, I told you about the differences. There are four kinds of meaningful differences that you can you can take. Um, and one of them, she uh, had ranked one of her transcripts a five, the other a zero um, against, I don't remember if it was the one transcript against two pictures or one coordinate against the two pictures. But uh, in one of those, there was a difference of five. That happened to be a hit. But now look down here. Down here, when the difference was as large as four, she got a miss. You know, there's just, we are in the midst of probability game. Um, precognition appears to be about probabilities. And I've yet to see anything that is 100% um, uh, yet. So we need to all learn how to get used to living with and applying these probabilities. But here with the four, this, this particular prediction was a miss. So the average between this one and this one is 50%. But the next four was a hit. So it went up to 66%. You got two hits out of three. Again, using this concept of greater or equal the maximum CR difference because the assumption here is that the higher the difference, the stronger the probability of, of getting a hit will be. Well, in fact, while this is a curve that goes through this, it's a least square fit curve, um, you can see the data here when the differences were three, she managed to get up to um, well over 80%, almost 90% when the differences were at the level of three. Okay, and then 2.5. And here's her 55% again. But um, there isn't a particularly good trend here. Um, Yet that, that's what the data shows. So this is, you know, we're looking at these, and I suspect different people, well, I know different people will have different trends. For some people, this might actually be the best trend as opposed to something like this. So this is really a summary of what we've looked at um, uh, for the one viewer. This was the cumulative hit rate. Um, this is a the, the hit rate with this Lauer Z. Remember Lauer, th those of you who have been following this for a while, he was kind of the one um, that said, why don't you use a normal-like statistical measure? Um, and uh, this is the max uh, um, CR. This is the one with the standard deviation of two. This was just another way um, and now I kind of want to talk a little bit more about this way, uh, of the confidence rankings. This is a straight histogram. Remember, there was one five here, and then she had two fours. One miss, the red shows a miss with the zero, and this is a hit. Um, and then she had two 3.5s, and she had three misses, in her case, at the 2.5 level. Um, now, there's something else which I'm doing, which is another way of looking at all of this data. 
and I wanted to, uh, um, you know, I'm always trying to understand this better and come up with better, better ways of making sense out of this. And this word reliability with its normal meaning is really key for us. And by that, I mean these other curves here are really used to come up with the probability that the next prediction or your current prediction, that's what this P means. Um, in, in this case, the person happened to have a Z with a standard deviation of 2 of 1, say. Now, if I were to use this curve, I would put this up at 90%, um, or maybe even 100% based on this data, but I didn't believe that. So in my model, the highest I'm currently allowing a prediction to get up to is 80%. And so that's why I plotted this P here. If it had been lower, in fact, here's one here, okay, using the other definition of LZ, where it came out to be 0.8 and the predicted probability was 0.65. So using this measure, you got a prediction of 0.65. Using this measure with a max of 0.8, you got a probability prediction of 0.8. Down here, it was 0.75. Here, it's 0.57 or something like that. So these are different ways of getting probabilities. Well, the ultimate, um, sitting here as somebody who says about to make a trade, what do I do? Do I average this? Um, time is going to tell which one of these are the best one, which one is the most reliable. So let's take a look at this concept of reliability first in the concept of the, um, with the idea of this confidence ranking, um, just because it follows nicely from where we are, and it's, it's relatively easy to understand, I, I hope. So using this confidence ranking curve, which, you know, this is one way of looking at it, um, which is just based on the raw hits. This is the confidence ranking approach where the five is here and here are the two fours I talked about. Another way of looking at it is to say, let's just look at what our probability of a hit is from this curve. Okay, so notice that this happened to get high here. And what I really want to know is the reliability of this particular um, number, the probability of the next one being a hit. So not using this curve, but using the raw data. So that's what this shows. There were, based on now, probability bins. So, what do I mean by a probability bin? Well, the highest one would be greater than or equal 0.8 to 1. So, that would be a bin from here to here. Okay? So, I have four that were in that bin. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. So these four made predictions which were um, in the range 0.8 to 0.1. Here was 0.7 to 0.8. Here's 0.6 to 0.7. Here's 0.5 to 0.6. Again, the red means um, they were misses. The blue means they were hits. So here when there was this high probability, when the curves went up, the, the points went up, um, we got four out of four. Here, we got a 50-50 probability, and here we had um, one hit and uh, two misses. Now, in terms of the probability, and um, you would like to think 
if the predicted probability is between 70 and 80 percent, that when you get enough data, the actual probability would would be that. And that's what this curve is. Notice here, it was 50-50. Now, there's not a lot of data here yet, but what I'm showing is the setup, which we will see in the future whether or not these are, in fact, self-consistent. So that when you predict a 75% hit rate, you get roughly 75, say 70 to 80, as opposed to, in this case, 50. Um, notice this 100 was, of course, very nice. And here, we, we predicted between 60 and, and um, uh, 70, and um, we only got 33 because we got two misses. Okay. I'm trying to go slow, but I know I, I think I know I'm giving you a lot. The point here is we now have a way of are we consistent? Are we reliable? Can we go in in principle? Again, if there was a lot of data, um, can we go in and know that the probability of the next prediction is going to be X. You know, if we predict between here, is that what we're going to get? And um, in many ways, that's the key thing which has always been looked at in, in terms of both remote viewing and ARV. You know, when they would measure remote viewers' um, head scans, they were looking for some signal that would tell them the remote viewer was on. Now, you know, we always thought about that as being on 100%. Um, I've come to the conclusion that even if, the, and they, as far as I know, they've never been successful. But they might have been more successful if they were looking for, was he on, you know, two-thirds of the time when they got a certain signal, because I believe that's the best we're going to do. That's certainly what we're seeing. Um, and that's because of things like displacement. So it's a probability um, um, game, if you will. Now, here is the same sort of plot, the exact same plot, but this time using that measure for LZ. And here you can see for the high LZs, and this is consistent with what you saw before, so it's another way of looking at the same thing. We, we have 100% if the prediction is between 0.8 and 1, and 100%, again, with only 1, this is all not statistically significant numbers of data, but the trends are very encouraging. Um, and uh, here for the 0.6 to 0.7, we have a 50-50 probability. And down here for 0.5 to 0.6, you can see it's, it's down here. OK. Um, I started putting together data for other viewers and all that, and I decided I was going to stop here. Um, I have other viewers that are looking about like this, looking good, other viewers that are not looking good. Um, um, there's a lot more work to be done in terms of, of applying this. Um, however, from the perspective of being able to learn and being able to teach, um, I've already seen some cases where this plot, for example, I had one person who was giving me all tens um, here. Well, not all tens, but like um, a quarter of their stuff was tens. And I was looking at, and that led me to look at the way they were judging. And their judging was very unusual, and I talked to them about it. And they, in fact, acknowledged that they had changed the way they had, were judging. And that happened just at the time when their hit rate was going down. 
So I think by watching what's going on here and looking for things which are unusual versus what we see in the better viewers, the, the, the viewers who are having the high hit rates are the ones that are showing these kind of trends as opposed to being more sporadic. Um, I believe that I, as a group manager who want to help my viewers and, and teach them things, are already gaining insights, which I then, of course, pass on to them. And I also think that they will be able to get insights simply by looking at their own data. Now, at this point, the only data they have access to is the cumulative hit rate as well as um, the all the words and stuff that all of you know that you put in. You get to see that at the end of um, your, your putting in your prediction. Uh, however, I am working on giving access to this particular plot, a plot very much like this, to the viewers. I just haven't been able to um, um, do that yet. Okay, with that I will stop and um, let's have uh, questions and comments. So a bin is not a fancy mathematical term, it just means a container that you drop things in and collect things in. Between this range, correct. Yeah. Okay. Was that too much? Did you guys understand that? Not understand that? Got the, the only ones I see with speakers on are myself and you, Scott. Tom. Tom sounds uh, good. Oh, and Tom. Okay, Rick. I maybe lost Rick and Patsy or Don or. Yes, I did understand it. Okay. I did too. I, I understood it, and um, I think I need to digress in another area, which is, um, you know, grading my transcripts. I, I actually haven't been grading my transcripts very high, and um, I was wondering if there was a source that I could go back to um, and the basics, you know, looking at the, I believe you're using the TARG grading method. Yep, uh-huh. And I, it's kind of strange because, um, you know, when I do my ideogram, sometimes, it, well, it just seems like I start out with some biologicals, and it's almost like a preamble to a, a data stream, and um, but I one transcript I I did I I had seemed like all over the board, and but in there was you know flapping wings, and it turned out um, that picture turned out to be an insect, um, and the wings were you know it's a close up of a insect, so. Um, Sometimes I've had better results with with a monitor um, because I'll pick up certain things and then they'll you know cue me um, to look at the biological mm -hmm. and then I, I know what to focus on. But um, I just feel that I need more work in how to grade my sessions and. Um. You know, my, my own confidence. I, so. I, I do understand. We've had a f couple of, well, more than a couple, going, going way back, we've had many webinars on the judging. Um, there's a certain amount of subjectivity to it for sure. Um, because even if you read the TARG scale, which you should should read and basically use your best understanding of that in a in a consistent way. Um, 
and consistency is probably more important than anything else because that's how the differences in these kind of curves that you're seeing here, these kind of points, are going to play out because you will know if you're better, if you should be moving up that scale or not once you get your understanding of what that means. And I'll just let you know that when we've had multiple people use one transcript against one target, typical variations in confidence rankings are like plus or minus one. So the fact that you feel uncertain about how to judge a particular one, you know, it's like join the crowd. There is no, quote, right or perfect way. In my opinion, the perfect way is being consistent. So, like, whatever you do is just right, as long as the next time you do it, you use kind of the same philosophy, the same understanding, and you come up with a confidence ranking number. Okay. So I hope that really helps you because, um, you know, you look at the words like um, number four, confidence ranking of four, good correspondence with several matchable elements intermixed with some incorrect information. I want you to know I printed this out. I've got it <laughs> right in front of me um, because questions about it come up, you know, I do viewing and, and I judge as well. Um, and I've come to an understanding of all the terms. But, you know, what does good correspondence mean? That is a kind of subjective um, idea. The CR of five, good correspondence with unambiguous, unique, matchable elements. Well, what exactly does unambiguous mean and matchable elements? You know, that certainly means better than a four. And I have a sense. I know what I mean by those words. And when I judge it, if somebody asks me, why did I give it a five? I can tell them that I had several of these that were just really, I thought that was an unambiguous match, okay? Um, and it was unique. For a three, a mixture of correct and incorrect elements, but enough of the former to indicate that the viewer had made contact with the target. So a three is like right on the border. But then a four goes up the good correspondence with several, okay, several matchable elements intermixed with some incorrect information. I'm, I'm reading these because when you use them and you go to them for the first <laughs> 10 times, you know, and read them and try to figure out where you are, pretty soon you come to the way you do judging on that scale. Be consistent with it and then you're doing it just right. And also let me say, when you see your feedback, it fits in. Because like your example with the wings, I don't know how you judge that particular one, but when you saw the feedback of that, you probably said, you know what, maybe I should have given a little more credit for that element. Because, you know, that's part of it, is how much weight do you give the matches versus the misses. Um, yeah, to, to tell you the truth, I've you know, I've never wanted to overrate myself, and I have a tendency to um, slam myself. So, well, I've been given, you know, like the one with the wings, mm -hmm. maybe a confidence ranking of one, ah. or even or even zero, you know. Well, it, and but then afterwards, I look and I think, well, you know, that's pretty interesting that I got the sound of the flapping wings. Uh -huh. And, you know, uh, it is a function of how much else is in there that was off, but um, um, a, a thing you should be noticing, and notice you now have records um, with we, you know, you've seen the kind of records that, that we keep, that you have, you can look back and say, 
you know what? I really would have had a much higher hit rate and I would have gotten three out of four of these that I passed on because I judged myself too low. Three out of four of these had I taken into account something like the wings example and not been so hard on myself, um, I would have done much better and then change your behavior. That, that makes sense. And I'm still um, trying to get in my mind the, the four numbers, um, the four, um, you, you know, the, you have a, a group you know, of over or under for one target and over or an under, I believe, for the second target. Oh, you mean uh, the four CRs? The four CRs, and then I'm wondering if there's an inverse, if they're supposed to be inversely related, like if I have a 3.5 on one, is the other CR supposed to be lower? Um, okay. I, I get done with my sessions and then and then I have to change modes and uh, um, grading and trying to get the four right. <laughs> you know, I, I just need to study study more, I think. Uh, Tom, let, let me just say, you're like a, a, a perfect <laughs> question. What you just raised is so important um, that I really want to make sure I answer this one properly and, and correctly in a way that you and anyone else listening to this understands. The putting in of the four CRs is the critical step in terms of making everything I've talked about up to now kind of work. The key element for doing that is to do all four of them independently. The confidence rankings that you put in that table, each of them should be done totally independently. You take one transcript, you use it against one of the, either the winning side or the other side, but just one of the photo sites. I hope it's clear where the confidence ranking number should go for that, right? The, the confidence ranking number, God, I wish I had a picture to show, but I, I you know, it's in, but all of you are we users, so you understand the picture I'm talking about. There's one where there's the coordinate, and then um, there are two places to put confidence rankings next to that. One is under what's called the winning side photo site, which is right there on that page, and the other is the other side photo site, which you can click and see that whenever you want to. So you take your first transcript. You look at the winning side photo site. You know, forget the label. You just you can think of it as A. You can think of it as whatever you want to. But it's that photo site versus the first target, and you just look at that and you rank it. It's got nothing to do with anything else at this point. You're wearing your judge's hat. The judge's hat is 90% intellectual. 10% intuition because you know yourself, you know um, what you did and what it might mean to you, um, and and that's a good part of this. You know, I happen to be a great supporter of self-judging. You do that one, period. You then go, and I'm now recommending using that same transcript, um, you then go to the other um, photo site, you click it, and you say, oh, okay, now I'm going to judge this against that, totally independently of anything else. And you judge it. And you don't worry about if the numbers are the same or if they're different. Um, that all has to do with the analysis at the end, but as you're as a judge, you don't do that at all. Independent. Absolutely critical to make all this work. Then you go to your second transcript. 
and you go and you go back to the winning target photo and you judge it totally independently. And then you go to the other with the second transcript and judge it totally independently. Now, maybe after each one, in fact, you put in the CR in the appropriate box just to make it really clear that they're totally independent. A lot of people put the CRs on their um, transcripts with winning WS and a number. However you do it, you end off with four CRs and um, critical that they're totally independent. All the analysis I'm showing you now is showing that those CRs should be different, but not that you should make them different on any basis other than independently judging them as being different. Well, that makes complete sense. Um, okay. I, I was just wondering if um, you could send me a, a link for past webinars that um, I can go through that you may, you know, on this subject. Yeah. I've, I've got a um, session coming up for, that's due Friday at 9 p.m. Yep. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to throw some strikes here. Okay. And, and I'm talking to, <laughs> you know, there used to be a place I could see the name of the person. I don't see it here, but this is Tom. Yes. Okay, yeah. Tom, I will send you links on that, and this will be recorded as well. So I will find um, a old um, aging analysis judging uh, webinar. Thank, thank you, Marty. I appreciate. Yeah. Excellent. Marty, Rick Dryer. Yeah, hi, Rick. Um, send that link to me also. Okay. Send that link to me also. Okay. And then as we continue here, if you would do the um, the confidence ratings, continue the process right now a bit, pass the um, CR numbers to our personal rating, personal uh, confidence. Yeah. Describe that for a moment. Um, the last part where we do our... our um, Oh, right. okay. Okay, got it, yeah, got it. Right, the PCRs. PCRs. Um, mm -hmm. That is something which um, Mark Samuelson uh, found a correlation of um, quite a while ago and felt it was um, quite important. I put it in uh, relatively early on because I wanted um, people separate from the judge. You remember how he said the judge is 90% intellectual, 10% intuitive, you know, roughly. You know, that's the way you should be thinking about it. Yes. You, you should be thinking about it of, okay, did I hit the target? You know, I'm, I'm um, okay. But then separate from that, uh, so many times, People do have these intuitive feelings, separate from the intellectual, about whether they felt it really was a hit or not. And I would see stuff like that in the comments they were at right. And um, so um, that's what the PCR is for. Separate from uh, uh, anything else. How separate do from the actual physical hard rating Ex exactly correctly do you have reason to feel differently it turns out 90 percent of the time this is one of the reasons I actually removed it and then because it was another complication I try to keep things you know simple simple <laughs> as possible but then mark right. convinced me to put it back and so now I put it in there as optional um, but but that's the purpose of that is if you um, and actually, it may be useful for some people to, to put in, even if it's the same as they judge, but they might now want to put in even a higher confidence ranking because they just feel really good about it right now. And Correct. so you, you put in um, which coordinate and which side. I've added the side there now. So, you know, 
Coordinate one is always side one, coordinate two is always side two. Um, period. And then you use a targ like scale. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different in terms of its meaning, but you use a targ like scale to say how comfortable um, you are with that. And it, it works really well. Catherine loves it. I like it a lot. Okay, good. And after you're done doing all four, you've got all that information just to kind of feel into and you really feel where you're at um, after doing your own judging. So it's actually seems to be a really good place to do that, really good uh, option oh. from a viewer standpoint. Okay. And that of – No. I'm sorry, go ahead. Now, are, are, are you using that, or eventually you'll have that in statistics also, correct? In fact, on the stats that you see, it is in there. If you look at your stats, you'll see that you get a hit if your personal prediction is in the correct direction, as opposed to it being based on the CRs that you put in. So it actually trumps, if you will, the CRs. So I've had okay. people actually go the opposite way. They felt they were on a missing streak or whatever, and it trumps it. In the analysis I'm doing now, I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, um, I actually Good. will eventually. Yeah. I will eventually. Okay. Because it may be, you know, for people just like you. Again, as I say, mm -hmm. I think different measures are going to be better or worse for different people. And I want to use these multiple measures and see which ones are the best and then use that as the basis of a prediction for that person. And so for you, that may turn out to be the best. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. another, another tool and potentially the more psychic personalities after doing the work, again, they get their real hit psychically at the end with all that information. I, I totally yeah, agree with that's, that. Yep. That's great, Rick. Yep. That's great. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Don, you're... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just curious if um, there... The, the group manager keeps track of my r running score if or or do we keep our our own well you know our own th numbers they have access um, to yours so when you put in a prediction um, the group manager, has access to all of your data. They see exactly what you see when you finish your prediction. So they know about your hits and your misses. Um, and they, in fact, can see the comments you have previously made. Um, so they have access to all that. OK. Uh, thank you, Marty. I really appreciate, yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Uh, let's see here. Who? Don, you're relatively new. How is all of this um, striking? Striking you? We got the video, but no audio. Yeah, no, he might have hit the wrong muted. button. Or... Muted. Can I unmute him? I wonder. No, I'm not sure I can unmute him. Oh, yeah, there you go, Don. So how is all of this um, striking you? Well, I'm, I'm just still new to it, so this is the first time I'm looking at it. But I, I, I would like to get that link that you said you were going to send to uh, the other two guys to yeah. get an idea of. And then uh, you sent me uh, the prediction or the... Uh, code for this week so I, I submitted that in but what would be nice is if sometime in the future when you uh, you know just pretend like you're one of us out there and this is this is how you do it this is this is how you and you've probably done this before also but like with the current information this is what this is how you take it in this is how you uh, 
review your uh, your dialogue and everything, and this is how you come up with your CRs. You know, just a, a walkthrough video on that would be nice as well on the latest and greatest current you know, process that we. Use. You know what I'm going to do? I, it's it's clearly time to. I'll, I'll send out the videos, but I think the next um, uh, anything app that we have, we've typically had these on uh, Fridays. Um, turns out. Well, you know, it's too soon to Friday to call one anyway, but I'm going away. Uh, um, but I would say um, the next Anything app we do, I think we should do on just uh, on just this subject. The good thing about that is the form has changed since the last, it's changed quite a bit actually since the last one you did. What form? The, page, the web page has changed. So it'd be good to show it with the new page. Um, yeah, but but not only would I do it with we, but I think you know there are still people out there that do non we ARV, and judging is valuable. Maybe we'll even have. Uh, I think it was John who came up with Joe McMonagle's technique. Mm. Did we once do that in one of the webinars, Scott? Do you remember? You have sometimes a better memory. I don't think I don't think we actually ever okay. went through that. Maybe. So maybe we'll review that. Um, okay, good, Don. We'll we'll get you more information on this, and we have these anything apps um, on occasional Fridays, usually a, a couple of months, um, and and I think we'll take that one on. And Patsy, how about you? How are you doing? I'm doing good. No questions. Okay. I'm trying to. I listen more. I'm trying to understand your uh, graphs and charts, which you know I'm getting. Okay. Getting there. Okay. Good. Uh, very good. Then let me just see. I think. I don't know if there's anything else. Um, we want to talk about. I mean, maybe we're done. I'm. I'm happy to stay. Uh, I have a, a point, Marty. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just, Catherine and I went down to uh, Amarillo and did an ARV class mm -hmm. with uh, Lori, mm -hmm. Lori and Jim. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it brought home the importance of completing that feedback loop. Right. There's been many times when I've missed that because I know what the answer is, I know what the target looks like, but I haven't done it. That class, again, was a great refresher on the importance of doing that last step. Um, I'm bouncing around a lot to different places, and I don't have a normal schedule at all, so I've been missing that. So I just remember the importance of that. Um, the second thing on the cool down that I learned, Catherine and I both learned in the, who, is it? who does uh, drawing on the right side of the brain? Betty something. Right, right. I have a book. Um, Edwards, Betty Edwards. Betty Edwards, yeah. She's teaching a cool down now that is was fantastic for me where you stare at your palm, look at your um, the ridges in your hand, mm -hmm. all the your lines like your um, like your thumbprint or your fan, mm -hmm. and you draw those without looking at the paper. And what it does for artists is it gets them into the right brain. Mm -hmm. What it does for us is the same thing. It slows down. You actually feel the thoughts going away and then you feel your thought process slowing down. And so you can actually get to that place kind of in a methodical way um, before starting a session. Oh. And that's worked amazing. Where? <laughs> and you see. Is hmm? that online? No. She taught us to that in this class. It was a five-day class. Oh. And um, I can show you how it works sometimes. And, and you end up with scribbles. I actually do half a page, write my target number on it, and then do the writing, um, actual writing, which looks like just little lines. There's nothing artistic about it because you don't look at what you're writing. You're looking and focusing at your hand. And it's that act of focusing and writing that puts you in that, that state. So I would look at my left hand and I have, mm -hmm. I'm right-handed, and have my right hand right. just drawing all the You put things. it on the paper once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can lift it if you want. You put it on the paper once. I use a clipboard so the paper doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And then you look at your hand probably eight inches away and you trace each of the lines in your hand. What do you call those little lines? They're, uh, <laughs> I, 
I know. I, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, I forget the word is. Yeah. <laughs> so you're looking at the details and how they interconnect. Mm -hmm. And you're focusing on that. And you're focusing on your hand. And it only takes five minutes. You can feel it happening. And so then you choose at what point you're in the cool down you want. But it happens really quickly. Another way of doing cool down is just... So you could actually put that... Effective. In fact, if you wanted to, you could put that on the idiom. You could do an ideogram and put it under that or I guess you do it before I, that in your approach. I, you do it before you start. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's an ideogram in essence um, but then I include that in my in my paperwork for that session yeah. that goes along with it but it means nothing to right. anyone except that I knew that I did it. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. That's very interesting. I might try. The reason I said it my way is the way I do my sessions is I have the coordinate you know, on the top of the page, um, mm -hmm. and then I repeat the chord multiple times. But I could see myself doing this right on my page, um, near the top, and then I always draw a line when I start my real session. I mean, it's a slight modification, but it doesn't matter. But the point mm -hmm. is, it's the cool. You know, we all you, do a cool down period of some sort. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, let me go back though to your first, and thank you for sharing that, I, I may try that. Um, the feedback question, <laughs> no matter how many times anybody tells you, and this is so true for remote viewing, I think it's particularly true for feedback, um, you even use the word, it's the last thing you do, from the standpoint of precognition, I happen to believe it's the first thing you do. It's the most important exactly. thing you do. We're, it's when right, you know right. the truth. We're, we're in the loop, are How you? many times, <laughs> exactly, how many times have you heard me say it? Have you heard other people many, say it? Many, and, all the time. And yep, you harp on I, it. I, I, and for no matter how much <laughs> I harp on it, and what it shows is how strongly we are embedded in, attached to, nailed down to the linear time way of thinking. Exactly. And I mean, that makes sense. Let's face it. We live in the physical world. We spend um, most of our life um, thinking, feeling, being emotional in, doing everything in that world. It's when you now say, I'm now going to be doing my precognition, you have to set that aside during all three sessions, during the RV session, during the um, AJing session, during the feedback session. And you have to treat that and integrate that into your life as a precognitive session. I, I like checklists so that they create a checklist and the, the task isn't done from the logical point of view until the checklist is finished. Correct. Just because the last check on the checklist is that order, it's not in the time. That's right. Yep. And it has to be done and it has to be considered at least as important as all of the others. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, this yes. intention, attention, expectation. It's the same thing during the feedback session. And it is so easy to give up on that. Oh, I'm a little bit yeah. busy. I already know what happened. Yeah. And look, we uh, all have experienced it, and we all have to continually work on not letting that happen. Yep. Now, owning it is the beginning yeah. step. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. <laughs> uh. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm, I think we're done. I, anybody else have anything they want to add or subtract? Oh, I just had my grand puppy come up. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, Do you have the stats of individual viewers? that you send out, or do we not do that? Do I have a what? What did you? For each, 
for each section of this um, phase two. Yeah. Do you have stats in graphs? Oh, sure. I mean, the graphs and everything come up normally, if I'm understanding what you're saying. So all the GMs... Right, but not for the... not go. They don't go back to the individuals for their results. Will we get them individually? As not yet. You guys have Correct. Okay. Not yet. You get to see your hit rate graph, um, yeah. but these others... Um, um, eventually, I will make them uh, available, and if someone is really anxious to see them, they can call me, and I can I can send them off. But they're really the kind of product, thing that sure. you have to. And I'm not even sure everybody's going to want to see them. To tell you the truth, no, they want some, you know, people, some people just want to spend their time doing their three sessions. And you want to know something? That's absolutely fine. I have nothing wrong with that. If I see something that I think is worth mentioning, I will bring that to them because yeah. the way I do the judging with my we groups, and I believe Scott is going to be doing this as well, is we have access to all of these and we use it as part of the judging process. So, that's so as, as a viewer, can we go to your website and see our hit rate history? When you finish your um, session, when is it? I think it might be the feedback session. There's a link there that lets you have access to all your data. Okay, I've never gone there. I'll go there next right. time. Right, go Great. there next time and save okay. the link because then you can go there anytime uh -huh. you want. Okay. Yeah. So you have access to you have access to the front part of the data, the hit rate data, and all the words yeah. and stuff that you put in. Which is all we need. Yeah. Yep. Great. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, if anyone, anyone wants to have some fun, we could look at some uh, nice uh, clay examples and transcript examples. Um, oh, you want to do that um, here now? I think that would be really good to do in another. Uh, let me just see. I mean, sure, if you want to go ahead and do it, I'll pass it on to you. I see no reason not. It just doesn't seem to fit this. Uh, well, that's under other. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we could do it some other No, 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 no. no. Ask Scott. I, I, I'm, I, I will tell you why I did this, just being totally honest with you. Of course, I wouldn't normally react like that. My um, granddaughter brought over our cutest little puppy that you've ever seen, and we're babysitting <laughs> puppy sitting for it and it, it actually just came up and jumped on me and now it went back down and so, <laughs> and so I'm conflicted <laughs> and wanting to go um, down in fact you know what I think I will do if you don't mind mm -hmm. I'm going to make you the presenter and um, I'm going to go down and say hello but I will come back um, so and I uh, this is just fascinating stuff f for everybody. So uh, um, this is a rather unique way. As far as I know, there are only two or three people who are doing this within WE, but it's been um, quite quite successful. So with that, Scott, Scott, why don't you take over? Yeah, uh, my. Some of the original masters um, were actually using clay. It's actually part of the protocol for Stargate, and it, it just kind of got lost by the wayside. Um, Lori's still teaching clay. Oh, good. That's mm -hmm. good. Yeah, uh, and it's it's another way to to pull information out of your subconscious and to kind of work with a different mode. So so. Drawing something is one way, but working something with your hands is a completely different um, modality. So, in the past, I showed uh, I showed something like this one. So, Sunny is a friend of mine, and she she did this clay um, before she saw this hand grenade picture, and uh, she did a great job on that one. And this was just Play-Doh, pretty much, that you can get at 99 cent only store. And uh, I actually went out and bought a pack of 20 
different colors of Play-Doh, 20 colors. Mm. So now part of the intuition process is not just the shape of the clay, but the color. So we, we, pick, we try to pick the color, and I'm just shocked at how, how often we get the color right. It's like 50% of the time. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> so you can, you can use a pendulum to pick the color, or you can just use any, any other intuitive uh, trick that you can come up with. Uh, you can you know, feel the color in your hand or whatever. Um, so this was, this was something she did. And the same day, this was something I did. Uh, here's the yoga girl uh, by the ocean. <clears throat> I had this arch, and I got her hands being smaller than her legs. And then in my drawing, I got a life form by the water and some arches, and I got that she was like wearing something kind of silky and filmy, and light. So I I posted that a long time ago, but we've had a lot of successes since then. So I thought I'd show some of them. And then there's a new thing now. That someone introduced me to that I went out and bought, and it's called uh, kinetic sand. And nice stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, especially uh, people who <clears throat> who are managing a whole room full of kids uh, know that if you have a sandbox, then you might end up with sand all over the room. Um, and but if you have kinetic sand, this stuff kind of sticks together. And I'll show you what the packaging looks like. I went, I got this at uh, Toys R Us, but you can order it online. <clears throat> and you can see that you can just kind of shape the sand. It sticks together. It's not just grainy sand. It just kind of runs through your fingers. It's like a cross between Play-Doh and sand. So you can, it comes with these little molds, which I think are just distracting. So I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't use those in RV. Uh, this but, sand, your hands stay clean also, so going from paper back to the clay is always kind of messy. The sand is better, it seems like, a lot cleaner. Yeah, in a way, it doesn't get under your fingernails so much. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I actually like the clay a little better, but uh, um, one thing that's like sometimes hard for clay is if you want to build build something you know, uh, vertically. It can it can be difficult because you're trying to balance stuff on top of each other, and if you want to make something bigger, most most clay doesn't come you know as big as this sandboxes. So if you want to make something bigger or you want to build something up, or there's some times when the when the sand sand would be more appropriate. Uh, <clears throat> and then Sunny just uh, last Sunday, it was three days ago. Um, we had a successful chicken dinner prediction on the on the San Antonio uh, basketball game and uh, versus Memphis uh, Grizzlies, <clears throat> and for some reason she wanted to she wanted to good use the sand for the first time in months. She just intuitively thought that was going to be important, <clears throat> and it might have been because the green clay we had um, was dirty. I, I, I trapped a fly in there uh, while I was in class and we never didn't never found out what happened to the fly afterwards from after she cleaned it up so <laughs> it was a little spooky wondering um, so maybe she didn't want to use the green clay so she picked she picked the, the green kinetic sand and I and as, as you can see I have I don't have 20 colors of, of kinetic sand but I do have three I have green and have this which I thought was would be a cool color to get because it's like the color of trees or a building or something <clears throat> and um, and I think it comes with purple, and I forget what these are. I have blue, yellow, green, <clears throat> and brown, basically. But she picked the green correctly. So this was the target, and you can see that this target has six really visible things coming out of it, and she drew these six lines at almost exactly the, the right angles uh, to match these things. <clears throat> and your pictures aren't usually as good as your clay, but in this case, it was even better. Uh, she, she got all these little individual lines with the wires coming out. And she got some words right. You know, it's, English is not her first language, and 
she actually doesn't even know a third of the words that are in these word descriptor lists. She doesn't know a third of the words she's writing down here. She's just kind of intuitively thinking, okay, maybe one of these will work. Uh, but uh, she tends to be especially good at uh, <clears throat> at the dimensionals, um, which you know, which is almost the same as being good as the clay. It's, it's, it has to do with the shape of things. So, but she got things like spiraling and uh, a few other good words. But these, she she kind of specializes in the clay, and then the words are not her specialty. So, <clears throat> anyways, that was a good one. Um, but let me show you her very first uh, sandbox one. Let's see, it's. Uh, Hey Scott, Sunday. while you're pulling that, I've got a quick question for you. Yeah. What what do you uh, what what do you criteria you use to grab the colors? Do you just you look at a color and say, okay, that seems right, or do you you reach in the box and just grab a color, or what 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 is the <clears> process you use to grab the correct color that you work with? I've used three or four different methods, and and what Sunny does is something different altogether. I don't even know what she does. Um, but one of the one of the things we all do is pretty much cue ourselves and say, all right, what's what's the best color for this next session? And I did a whole webinar on on, on using clay. And uh, hold on a sec, hold on, I gotta turn off this. And I might I might actually do um, like three sets of clay. I'll, I'll do a clay um, before Right, that I'm kind of playing with during my cooldown. So before I even have the target reference number, um, <clears throat> in our class we often do clay, and the, and then we'll put that aside, and then we'll we'll get the target reference number, and we'll do the ideogram, and do the normal transcript, and then you know, as as part of stage six or something, uh, we'll do another clay, and we'll have a little bit more information theoretically. Um, because you know all that information comes in through through the TRN number, and then during the feedback session, uh, I encourage people to do another clay because you're you can do a perfect clay then because you've actually seen the photo, and 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 this is another way to communicate to your past self that this is what it feels like, this is what the target feels like, this is this is what a major shape in the target feels like. Uh, but to get back to your question. For me, I'll say, what is the best color uh, for my, what I call it the precog clay, you know, before my session, uh, for this next session. And then I don't want to have to go through this, I don't want to have to break the, the trance in it. So I want to pick these two colors, you know, way ahead of time. So <clears throat> I'll say, what's the, what's, what's the best precog color clay and what's the one, what's the one for the, Clay I'm going to do during my session, and uh, and then I like to use a pendulum. But if I don't yet have a pendulum, I'll just kind of uh, maybe run my hand over and feel what kind of vibrates or what kind of feels right. Uh, sometimes I do something called body dowsing, uh, where <clears throat> uh, you know if I I'll say is this a good color or not. If I kind of fall forward, then that's a yes, and if I kind of lean back, then it's a no. So, so any yes or no, body dowsing, pendulum dowsing, whatever method you do, you choose, you can. I don't know. You know I'm sure you have some some idea. Uh, it almost doesn't matter. And so that's that. So her her very first. Um, did I answer your question? Anyway, so her, her very first target was this, uh, it's hard to tell there, but that's like a, a, a wire basket. So it's it's concave. It's like a bowl. And it has three feet on the bottom. And uh, so she did, she did an upside down, it would be a lot easier, an upside down uh, convex bowl with the three legs sticking out. So it really matched. Uh, Amazing, match. yeah. Yeah, 
And then we use, these are popsicle sticks. And like our teacher encourages us to use popsicles. This was actually uh, more like an etching tool we use that's, that's made out of wood. Uh, and you can get popsicle sticks, uh, you know, really cheap. Hundreds of them, really cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. And or you can collect them or whatever. Right? So I often um, use these to make structures, these popsicle sticks, and then I, these have a really pointy end to it. So I actually inscribe things into my clay uh, using the pointy end. <clears throat> and I also have like paper clips laying around on my desk, so I often use I often use paper clips. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in that one example I showed, here was an example of a paper clip. Oh, not that one. Let's see. Uh, here we go. Here we go. So here was a tomato on a vine with a thick vine coming out, and I had I picked the right color for the tomato, and I had a paper clip laying around. So that was a big that was a big hit. Um, and then that same session, that was a wee session. So you kind of like you know one transcript to really match one photo, and another transcript to really match the other, and for them to be different, distinct. So while I was, uh, one of the words I got in my dimensionals um, it was the word axle. And when I was working with the clay, uh, that's another trick, right, to use two color clay in the same sculpture because then it has a nice uh, contrast to it. So you can really see that I did these transverse axles here that match the car. Uh, and I knew that the, I, I had a, I, I dug my thumb really into it because one of the very common things you you notice with clay is if something's hollow inside. Uh, so I actually hollow this this and then a square, so it gives you an idea that's a man-made object. So I knew that was I knew this thing was hollow inside, and that the car is hollow inside, and it had two transverse axles, and I made a nice distinction with this one. So this clearly matched this. Hey Scott, uh, what about the Lexus V on the front? Do you see uh, that? I actually in my in my drawing, I actually no, that's the insignia. Oh, the D? Yeah, see no, it? I, I see it there. I didn't draw that, but I, I drew a black square, a black rectangle. Oh, oh yeah. wow! This stood out for me. Nice. Uh, I don't, I didn't, I didn't show my drawing in here because my drawings aren't usually all that good. But I did draw the lines on the floor, and uh, and this this black. Thing in front. Uh, and how do you store that? Since we're all listening here, you Which know, it's you nobody tells you how to score it. But um, one of the one of the ways Joe taught us in Vegas is is this does this count as a full gestalt or a half gestalt or no gestalt? And so I use I use I use that method. So the, if if you're drawing um, you know, gets gets some gets gets some major shapes or gestalts uh, that match the target. Then um, the gestalt is half your score. Mm -hmm. So you total up all your words, and then you you then you then you give points for whether you got the gestalt or not. And the gestalt is worth half of everything. Yeah. So on this one, I would give it. I, I I usually tend to be really conservative and and again I was just I'm just learning how to uh, judge with clay, so I gave myself half a gestalt on this one. Uh, it's not even a full gestalt, um, but still that that raises my score and it raised my confidence quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, even if this is this is even if this was a mediocre match, it, as long as it is this picture. Was really distinct from this one. Um, yeah, it's it's key. good for a, it's good for a wee prediction, right? Yep, that's ARV. And this was, yeah, and this was a wee. Yeah, it's ARV. So you, how well you match is not so important as how distinct it matches. Right. How did you uh, connect 
this to and the confidence ranking when you put in the we confidence ranking scores well you know um, I, I just said is, is it worth half a gestalt or not or is it worth a full gestalt just like the way uh, Joe grades the pictures and the words yeah but he gives a numerical score how do you think he gives a numerical score by totaling up the words and then he and then he he div and then he adds in the, the Gestalt score and divides by two. But so the Gestalt the Gestalt is like half your score, and I gave myself half the Gestalt for this matching this. No, no, no. But I'm asking a different question, um, which is how do you then relate this to the zero to seven Targ scale when you put it into the we numbers? Okay, so this was the say this was the winning target, right? And this was my first transcript. Then, um, if my if I got half the words right and half the words wrong, then that's worth about a you know a three or so. That's worth like 0.5 on the scale um, from that's getting 50% right. And then, uh, if I give myself half a gestalt then I'll take 50 plus 50 and divide by 2 and come up with 50 and multiply that by 7 and then I get like about a 3.5. Okay, so what you're using is kind of a linear 0 to 100 versus 0 to 7. That, that's pretty much what, okay. what Joe McMonagle did, right? Because he, he, he pretty much got a percentage of the words correct, right? If I got 5 out of 10 words correct, um, then then you take 0.5, and then if I give myself a full gestalt, then I take 0.5 plus 1 and divide the 2 and get like 0.75. And then if I scale that by multiply by 7, then I, it's more like a 5. If I give myself a full gestalt, then this, this comes out to like a 5 on the target okay. scale. Well, but I, I'm, pretty, I'm usually pretty conservative. See, Marty, would you, I don't know if you heard all the words, but... Um, for me, a targ rating on that would be easily a five because of all the matchups. Um, and I'm, trying to I'm glad you're d d d d discussing this, this because great. when we have this anything app on this subject, which is very important, some people may want to use the targ, um, may want to use the um, McMonagall approach because it tends to be a little bit more analytical. Um, in you know, in the sense of 50% is gestalt, you have to sort of think that you you do gestalt well at the beginning. Um, but then the conversion has never been clear to me. So it's you know we're now discussing right. it, and uh, I think you know this will be really good, Scott, for you to do and try to almost be more analytical about it, though. Like like you're being now in words, but. You know, maybe even yeah, right you bring there. an interesting point. Yeah, when 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 Joe did it, he come out with a score between between zero and one. Like he came out with a ninety percent number or something like that. He didn't scale it for the exactly. Target. And so I'm multiplying that by seven, and then rounding way the hell down. Yeah, uh, is is what I do. It's it's really it doesn't uh, give me the, an exact target score, but it, it it it's good if I have four scores. It, it gives me an idea of relatively. Uh, how they how they relate to each other. Right. Well, I think you scored like I would have scored um, using targ stuff. I use the targ sheet. I keep it in the front of my binder. <laughs> I have a binder for phase one, binder for phase two. I keep it right there in front of me, so I'm always looking at it. Right. And um, you ended up on a targ score that I would agree with. Mm -hmm. yeah. I took Catherine. And I went to the to uh, Joe's class at uh, in Virginia and spent five days with him. Monroe with Institute. Health. Yeah, with about 20 military guys, <laughs> and we didn't go into story, scoring that much. Um, he did better on it at Irva on the scoring part, um, right. as far as going over it. So you got you got the whole whole bit of it there at Irva. Yeah, Alexis has a has another formula that he put into his Dung Beetle spreadsheet thing, which which right. they want to adopt. Yeah, that's yeah. common. You meant App 2014, right? Correct. And and Correct. we'll have an opportunity to ask him about that again in App 2015, but um, I think this is so you know Scott, if you would take on 
trying to quantify this being more conservative step. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you were just to say to take his percentage, you know, as a fraction and multiply it by seven, that would be an exact formula. But it sounds like you have this other conservative edge in there that you do, unless you want to say that every person should then bring in another factor um, of conservatism in, in it. Um, um, you know, the main reason I was conservative is one, because no one ever taught, this is like a new method. Right. I mean, no one ever taught me how to score clay. Uh, so and, I was, I was and being, the, the clay itself needs the description behind it, the two transactionals, the hole in the middle for the space for the man-made. Mm -hmm. um, the transcript that we don't see that shows the scores on the floor, that shows the black plate on the front. Those are really good hits on the TARC score that takes you up into the high fives, I think. Yeah. Um, right. That's not how, how Joe's doing it at all. But you kind of came to the same number. So whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can, <laughs> like Marty says, mm -hmm. put that out Honestly. there or not. Well, the interesting yeah. thing, he was talking about consistency. And, you know, as long as I'm doing the same conversion for all four scores, then at least the the distance between right. them is going to be that's <clears throat> that's exactly that's exactly right plus you know there are you know I did miss some of the conversation and I apologize for that but but what I do see are two different things an algorithm separate from the clay you know people might want to use and I think we ought to teach it and give them the opportunity to use the yeah. McMonical approach just for standard ARV transcripts standard we transcripts um, and then maybe you're saying that's where you would use this multiply the um, percentage that uh, McMonagall gets times seven, period. Right. It's only when you added scary. the clay that you had this um, additional. No, no, it doesn't change the math any. Um, I just, it's just that my picture may be not worth as much as the clay. And, you know, I might, it's just one gestalt. It's just one gestalt bag, just like Joe does. Um, it's just that my clay is more likely to. I give more. I give more weight to the clay just because I'm better at it, and and because I have. That's one of. That's my strongest modality. Yeah. Is is kinesthetic. And uh, self judging, you know that strength, and so right. you weight it accordingly, automatically. And that makes sense. Right. That's right. So you. Yeah. yeah. And in the description, the others can see it. I can see exactly what you're saying and see the match. That's where the personal scoring is so great. You yeah. know? And, and Not now just that the scoring, but the personal confidence rating. Yeah. Now that I have more experience with Clay and I've I've seen how many and and Sonny's twice as good as I am with it. Uh, you know, now I can score higher. Now I have more confidence that I see they turn into hits. Yeah. <clears throat> So I don't have to be as, as conservative. Mm -hmm. It's a moving target. <laughs> yeah, uh. yeah, yeah. So, so I just had these props laying around. You know, I didn't there. I, I didn't have any popsicle sticks at the time, so I might use my pen or a paper clip, whatever's lying around. And uh, and of course, I had to rotate it sometimes. Uh, I didn't mm -hmm. when I originally did it. When, I, when I'm presenting it here, everything's the right. You know the right rotation, but you know you don't really know that. Right off. So, <clears throat> to show a few other examples here. Let's see. All right, this was the this was the Taj Mahal. For some reason, they don't have the picture here. Let's see. The Taj Mahal has these four spires around it, and. Uh, That's that. Let me look in my. And so she did a good job of. Uh, sometimes, all you want out of it is is to look at the clay and say, is it man-made or natural? Because it happens to be that one photo is man-made and one is more natural. So if you have a lot of straight lines, and squares, then that's a clue that it's uh, it's man-made. And this was kind of, there was a frog with a kind of googly uh, red eye, one one googly red eye, and it had orange feet. And this was a good example of a life form um, because she kind of made a snowman, which is 
how you might make a human being out of clay. And, and this frog was a hard target for a lot of people and had just one big googly red eye showing and had orange feet. So uh, again, you can kind of tell that this one had to do with the natural life form target. And this one had to do with the Taj Mahal, which had these four spires around something. Uh, it had a square, but it was round in the center of the square. So that, this was this was easy to judge, you could say. It's a good example for a we of uh, distinguishing the two targets with the clay. So that was the Taj Mahal. And I wanted to show another good um, sand one. Let's see if I have that one here. Scott, are you in uh, LA? I'm in Los Angeles, yeah. Uh, we, we, there's, we take classes here uh, in El Segundo and in Pasadena, live classes. Here we go. So here was an example of combining clay and sand. So for this target, the balloon, she did this. All right. So she did two parts. She did the round balloon up there, and she did the basket down below. This is clay. This is actually kinetic sand. And uh, this is like an incense wood stick we got <laughs> a spiritual bookstore. Um, and this, and uh, this is one of those etching. You can see it's kind of sharp at the end. So she, you know, she connected the balloon to the basket, you know, with these strings. And um, it's hard to tell here, but this is actually yellow sand. And she picked the yellow sand on purpose, and she purposely made stripes on the yellow sand because the balloon has yellow stripes. And, and when you do kinetic sand, it comes in your own little sandbox here. So it doesn't get all over the place. <clears throat> and I guess uh, for some reason she wanted to use uh, clay. Or maybe she did the clay while she was meditating or something. So. That was a fun example. And then the other side, the other side of that we thing, she did pretty well too because it, this was the target, a keyboard, and she did a, something lying across this land surface. Uh, like two layered. So this, she made a slant to it. So again, for distinguishing two we targets, this one is obviously goes with this one. And you know this one obviously goes with this one. So that was successful enough. And all these are hits, by the way. I'm only showing ones that that resulted in hits. And then um, and then uh, White Cloud, who was successful for a lot of our early uh, hits. You're just a genius psychic who's having visions of the future every other day. It's kind of a pain in the ass to live with him because he's like, Scott, Scott, I just had this vision, you know, and something's going to happen. And then four days later, the Malaysian plane disappears, and the thing he described fits it. It's just, he's, <laughs> it's both annoying and amazing at the same time. Uh, and we're finally kicking him, kicking him off our couch. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this guy is so out there. He can't hold down a job except as a trucker, and he's on a two-month long haul right now. Well, I'll be glad if he can get work here in LA because he's just brilliant. Um, so, um, so he he made a boat out of out of this, and and when I when I taught a class, uh, we had the same target, and. Um, Another guy, and his name is, he's, he's in our group too, and he, he made almost the exact same, the exact same boat. So uh, people seem to, it, that was the first time I ever saw two people get the same target and make virtually the same, same clay. Uh, I think I have a picture of this clay here. Yeah, and so in class, this guy did 
a multicolored boat that looked like this. And I did a whole webinar on what we did in this class, and it's a lot like what you guys are talking about. Instead of focusing so much, if you call the cool down step one, and you call the transcript step two, and if you call the feedback step three, a lot of people spend a lot of time on step two, and sometimes let step one and three kind of slide. Hmm. Um, when I had a chance to teach the in-person class, because my teacher couldn't make it, uh, I made a point of really focusing on step one and step three. And, uh, and because we made so many connections, uh, and because we even did Clay in the feedback step, he had lots of information being sent back to him on color and, uh, and shape. So he also made a boat. Uh, so here's two people with the same target, both making boats. <clears throat> so I thought that was interesting. And then you got some interesting colors. You know, the water is green, the shell boats are green. So, so that was a good one. And uh, what else we got here? Oh, I just wanted to show you how creative Sunny is when she's not doing RV. Well, in this case, this was an RV target, but she didn't have any clay. So this was a tree, and this was how she made a tree out of paper. Uh, just kind of, she got the horizontal part aspect of the tree and sort of the color of the tree. And and this is this was her clay. <laughs> when she ran out of clay. <laughs> Alright, so she got that was a good example using something. And then she got a lot more creative on this one. So here we have like a trolley car with this thing on top, this big monster thing in front of it. And she and she got this and this, this dual light on top here. So she took a bunch of candle boxes and candles, and uh, you know, got the white thing in front and the, the dual lights, and she got the colors right, and uh, she got the fact that it had you no know, layers, and she built it up. It had, you know, I had it, you know, one thing here, another thing here, another thing here, another thing here. So she built it four levels. So that's kind of cool. And someday I'll show what she did. Uh, so last New Year's Eve, she was with a bunch of kids and wanted to entertain them. And she had a bunch of clay, and they made clay animals, and they made clay fantasy scenes, and and she just kind of naturally and creative. She did this as an actual ARV prediction, or just for fun with one yes. target, or what? No, this was this was a winning. This was a hit. This was a winning ARV. A we was it we by any chance? <laughs> yes, it was weird. these were the two things. So you can you can tell that that this really matched this is this more and this really matched this more. And uh, so she did a good job. She knows that's her strength, so even without clay she she wants to she just decided build to I mean that opens up really I wonder if we could do a webinar with this sometime and you know, have people bring oh, up yeah. a bunch of stuff they don't even have to have clay, just have available things from your house <laughs> and right. get moved to put together shapes and you could show that would be sort of interesting. And you know, everybody has yeah. smartphones pretty much this day and age. They could actually just share them. Sure. So here's Windwalker, my teacher. So this was also a hit. Uh, so he drew this he didn't know it was a swan, but he drew this like snail thing. Uh, he got the arch, the arch in the swan neck, and uh, and uh, and then he he did a similar arch kind of in in clay, and he got all these words right. He got that it was just a nature scene, and he was really focusing on the curving of the neck and the curving of the back. And he got the life form and the hood with the tail, and mountains, land, water, contrasting textures, coarse and smooth. So I actually did grade this one, and after it became a hit, he he makes a, a composite out of it. 
<clears throat> Did you pass this on to um, Teresa? No, not all of them. Why don't you pass them. some? Why don't you pass these on? It'd be great for ARV for fun, and hell, we might even want to put it on the app website. I mean, this is good stuff. Right. Uh, so this was an RV student who came into class, and this was his very first day. He had never done RV in his life. This is this is Santa Monica Pier by the beach here, and he drew this uh, bridge with a car on it. There's a car over there. <laughs> and he's, got the, he's got the pylons in the water, and he wrote Tall Bridge. And this might have freaked him out that he did so well on the first day, and he didn't come back for six months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but now he's he's actually in uh, chicken dinner. I think I did train him once, uh, but he he's not a regular yet. And. Uh, my teacher actually had, he called this an ancillary environment because my teacher actually showed the main target, which was somebody uh, parasailing out on the water, and that's the one I drew. But then right right during feedback time, he shows, assuming that you have pineal gland season 360, he shows like views around it. So this was one of the views around it. Um, but on that one, I, I drew, since the parasailer was way up in the right corner of the photo, I asked myself, where, if there was a human being in this photo, where would it be? And I drew it way the hell on the right corner of the page above all the words where I don't really put words. So I remember this one. I was in class when he, when he did this one. <clears throat> and if I have the Queen Mary here, that's just the best composite I've ever seen. Uh, I don't Yeah, this one was decent. You got the uh, the lines on the road, and uh, the this thing that sticks up to get the electricity from the wires up above. And you got a lot of the words right. When you got that, it was moving laterally. So these were good drawings. He, he got the bolts in the uh, tire. These are all uh, chicken dinner hits. And then here's a swirling, swirling cloud around the earth. A storm. And we got water and swirling and energy and radiating and all that. He liked this one. He didn't mention it here, but he got a lot of energy symbols. And he had a lot of words right. He thought it was a boat or a ship. And then in class, he had this one. So this is actually a picture of him at Christmas, nice Christmas. And this is a floating uh, fish. Uh, like the cartoon, like the uh, animated movie Nemo, Funny Nemo. And so, you need a lot of clay for that one. So this was a really good clay for this. And he was trying to challenge our our perceptions here because, you know, does this count as a biological? Uh, it does. And so we've got the Christmas tree and all this stuff in there. I wish we had the Queen Mary here because that was just uh, amazing. So with ARV, we're not going to the target. We're describing the photo feedback. No, I, disag feedback. I disagree with that. Oh, really? How people, okay. people get, I know, sometimes people who don't like ARV say that. It is not true. <laughs> hey, look at okay. all the times people get sounds. How do you get sounds if all you're doing is going to the photo? Yeah, how do you get any of the sensory? How do you get smells? People get smells all the time. Even how do you get action? Yeah, I think going to the yeah. going to the photo helps. And uh, but when we're, when we're judging, we want to encourage people to try to just draw, describe what's in the photo because it's you can see, you can verify, well, wait, right? the way yeah. I say it is right, verifiable from the photo, but 
go to the site to get the other information that is verifiable from the photo. So I see the. So here's the. I'm oh, sorry. I was ahead. just going to say I see the photo almost as a transfer agent. You know, yes, you go to the photo, and certainly geometry and things like that you can get directly from the photo. You know, geometry is one of the big things that people. You know, you can see how much geometry mm -hmm. is important. That you can get from the yeah. photo, but. Um, there's much more that you get by going to the site as well. Yeah, yeah. that's where our best viewers are saying, you know, what is the cameraman seeing right now? Pretend I'm the cameraman, what do I see there? And one target was a, was a, a crab, and uh, the viewer knew it was a life form, maybe thought it was a little boy, and said, what is he doing with his hands? And he caught this pincer movement that the crab was doing. Mm. Wow. So if the target is just a photo, you wouldn't get motion like that. Right. I think you you have to get closer. Yeah, the so the, cra yeah. so the crazy guy on the couch having visions all the time did this, which is probably the best vision that I think I've ever seen. This is the Queen Mary, and there's actually a Russian submarine here. And uh, so this was... Uh, actually my teacher uh, visiting Long Beach and he went into the torpedo room for the Russian sub and so the main target was this and so I drew the propeller here and I and the, I, the clay really helped me on this because I kind of started out with what these other people were drawing like a clover and I said no I want to draw this sawtooth thing because I think it's cutting through something and uh, the clay gave me that so a lot of people focus on the propeller. Um, but he did show these ancillary photos afterwards, the outside view. And and whether he showed this or not, my friend is just so psychic. He always goes outside and draws incredible detail. So, you know, he, these lights across the top of the Queen Mary, he's got that. Um, he, he, always, he almost always draws the exact same number of smokestacks or steeples on the church or whatever. It's like, number, he got the propeller for the sub. He's got the sub separate from the boat. And the boat has a big propeller too. And uh, it was just uh, crazy, crazy good. And he's got smoke coming out. That's remarkable. And yeah. I got all these I got all these words. Uh, as a class this was a good success. And he tried to the way he structured this class was instead of us all doing stuff separately, we pretended it was an intelligence briefing. And we all kind of contributed and he kind of combined the stuff that we agreed on. So we agreed on these propellers and and um, and the psychic guy. He said, I, you know, you wouldn't want to be in front of this thing. It's big and it's heavy and it's moving. And uh, he wrote all these uh, words and knew he was in water and that it was you know, hollow. One lady said she thought the stuff inside these tubes was unhealthy. She wouldn't you know, had malice in there. These are torpedo tubes. Not a good feeling about it. They wouldn't want to get hit by it. Tubular, things like that. Um, Scott, it, it's mm -hmm. been two hours, and I know for planning purposes, yeah. I certainly, um, I have to go. Um, but I think... Sure, no, that's a good good spot. To okay, land. perfect. Boy, this was really interesting. Uh, pass on, uh, you know, as many of these as you can easily do to Teresa and I, I think we ought to do more of this. This was excellent. Um, okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. And um, I will be sending out the recording. And then I have an action item here to send out some webinar information um, about the judging. And, uh, yeah, your clay stuff and sand stuff has other judging elements to it but I must but that's really fascinating Scott okay so I'm I'm going to close the session now thank you all for coming and keep precogging all right thanks, thanks Marty thanks, thanks Scott Marty. Right. thanks Rick for your um, information about drawing your hand oh, oh, two more thing two more things on that quickly the lines that they call the plantar lines or the creases are not what we're talking about we're talking about the fingerprint lines, those little tiny guys, how they curve around. So it's the tiniest lines that you're looking at. Oh, the swirls. Oh, on the fingertips. 
Yes, it's it's not the creases. It's the oh, or okay. anywhere in your palm. It's, it's the it's the yeah. That's why you're concentrating so much watching it and trying to draw it. And you're not trying to draw it correctly. You're just doing a you're not ever looking at your pen of the paper. You're just trying to follow it and match it. But it's it's okay. the fingertips. I, I didn't pick that up either. I no, it's not the fingertips. Well, it can be. It can also be your palm. You have those lines. Okay, but it's the real lines. small level lines, which I guess it's, increases, it's the, smallest level. increases right. the focus. Right. That's why. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you're down at the smallest level. Okay. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Clarity. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye now. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.